A turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And I got to tell you, we are now in this portion of uh, the Why series and why is the Holy Spirit important in your life that right now we're at a spot where we need to pause. Think about it. Just putting all the brakes on and stopping for a moment for us to do uh, regarding this Holy Spirit teaching uh, some inward reflection some focus on the Bible, and for someone who may be watching or listening right now, uh, you may not be a follower of Jesus Christ. And tonight is very important to you. It's very important to all of us. But if you're not a follower of Christ tonight, you need to be very, very alert. And um, follow with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to read it a little differently. Tonight we're going to be looking at, listen to this, What is the unpardonable sin? The Bible speaks about an unpardonable sin. And the Bible speaks that it is a specific sin of blasphemy that is committed against a certain person of the Trinity. And I say that specifically because Jesus makes mention, as you'll hear in a moment, that it's not against the Father and it's not against he himself, but it is specifically blasphemy committed against the Holy Spirit which fits and dovetails perfectly into our series of Wednesday nights in the life of the believer in the Holy Spirit's conduct. Matthew 12, 31. Therefore, Jesus said, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven men. If anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, that's Jesus, it will be forgiven of him, But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or this world, or in the world to come. So here comes the answer. I deliberately, listen, I deliberately read you chapter 12, verses 31 to 32, when Jesus opens up and says, therefore, I say to you, now watch this, take your eyes in your Bible and back up just a little bit to verse 25. He answers... This challenge of what is this blasphemy that is unforgivable? Jesus says in verse 25 of chapter 12, Matthew's gospel, but Jesus knew their thoughts, and that's key. He knew their thoughts and said to them, the kingdom of God is, well, every kingdom, he says, here is divided against itself, will be brought to desolation. Now, he's not speaking about the kingdom of God. He's speaking about the kingdom of, or kingdoms, plural, of this world. But specifically, he's going to be talking about Satan's kingdom. Every city or every house that is divided against itself will not stand. Verse 26, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, that's what they were accusing. You'll see tonight, the Pharisees, the, the religious leadership of Israel was, they, they, were, um, they were attributing Jesus' miracles that he was performing with him being in league with Satan and that he was the prince of demons. That's what they believed and that's what they preached. He says, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Exorcist, he's talking about. Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 29. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Verse 30, he who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So in your note taking, mark this down. Tonight, the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer But we pause to answer the question, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that Jesus says, the Bible says, is unforgivable? It cannot be forgiven in this world, and it's not forgiven in the world to come. Jesus himself says this. Very quick way of review. Number one, we looked at who is the Holy Spirit. We learned that he's a person. 
that he has a will and influence and that he has feelings and emotions and you can bless him and you can anger him. We learned that you could lie to him, Acts chapter five. Number two, where is the Holy Spirit in scripture? And we saw from the moment of creation in Genesis all the way through to the end of the book of the Revelation, the Holy Spirit is in scripture. Thirdly, we saw why is the Holy Spirit necessary in your life? And that is true for the unbeliever in conviction. It's true for the man that's coming to faith in Christ. And it's true for those uh, who are in between and trying to figure out what is it. The Holy Spirit is the one who is at work in this world right now in everyone's life, either convicting them of sin or leading them to Christ or, in fact, having secured a soul for salvation. That's very important. Number four, we looked at how is the Holy Spirit active in your life? And this is something that we're going to bring back later on regarding the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is is to be the one that is leading you, guiding you, directing your life. He has purpose for your life. He has meaning for your life. And that's a message that needs to get out more and more at a time like this when people are feeling like giving up on life. That was number five. Tonight, number six, mark it down. Here we go. What is the unpardonable sin? Will you write that down? That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. What is the unpardonable sin? What is this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? So again, look right down at your Bibles very carefully. I'm going to just refocus again. But um, as we do, look again at verse, let's pick it up at verse 25. Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, let me set the context up for you. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees and all, the religious hierarchy, they had been dogging Jesus' heels throughout the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. Everything that he would do, they would criticize, they would attack, they would go after, and they would not acquiesce to anything that he had done. Constantly bickering, constantly arguing, and the Bible tells us that they did this because of absolute envy. They had an envy that had possessed them that they came to hate Jesus. They wanted what he could do, but they didn't want to experience the relationship of the father to have that relationship. And Jesus said to them, you do not know my father and you don't know me. You would have to know me for you to have that relationship with the father. And that just infuriated them. And so for three and a half years, we read the gospel accounts of their angst against Jesus. And the key is that he knew their thoughts. So the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter four, verse four and five, and it's important to note, that we need to remember the message of the gospel. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. And that was his earthly ministry as it is recorded in those four gospels. Galatians 4.4 and verse 5 says, but when the fullness of time had come, in other words, according to God, when everything had been fulfilled that needed to be filled, the next thing on the prophetic calendar clock was this that God would send forth his son, listen, there's a qualifier, born of a woman, so we're talking about his incarnation, that is as God taking upon himself flesh, that's what that means, born under the law, Jesus was born a Jew, isn't that amazing? God came to earth and he took on the genealogy of a Jew. By the way, that was prophesied in scripture. Verse five, to redeem those who were under the law, that's all of us, including the Jew, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So Christ came at just the right time, this is the gospel, to redeem us back to the Father, in fact, adopt us into the family of God. Let's also remember that the message of the gospel came in power. The gospel message brought the power of God to earth. And Jesus exemplifies and lived that out in his humanity. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 says, And I, brethren, says Paul the Apostle, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What a powerful statement. Verse 3. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. 
and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Wow. That means human wisdom employing persuasive words in a spiritual context is anathema to God. Think of that. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What an amazing moment this is, by the way. I, I, here we are at this phase of uh, the really worldwide shutdown or lockdown. And, and here in America, communities are starting to wake up. There's people that are starting to rebel a little bit. I touched on that on Sunday. But um, there's the powers that be. There's the municipalities. There's the governments. There's the government leaders. I have to be honest with you. I would not want to be a mayor, a city council, a governor. I wouldn't want to be the president right now. I wouldn't want to be anybody in political power for this reason. They've got an impossible job right now. Because the, the buck stops with them in a sense that they don't want to order people back to work because if somebody dies, then someone's going to sue some mayor or some city council. That's ridiculous. And that's insane because people are always going to die. But we can't, but we're also going to die if we don't go back to work. And so we've got to go back to work, but no one's willing to step up and say, here's what we're going to do. Before this, this scourge was brought into our nation, we're going to go back to normal. So whatever was, was normal for you was working before this happened. We had the strongest nation, the strongest economy, uh, record low unemployment. We're going to go back to normal and pick it up where we left off. To me, that makes total sense. To me, that's what I'm going to do the best I can. But the leaders of our nation, they're terrified. They want to say that, but they can't say that because they're not going to step up and do the right thing because they're afraid someone's going to sue them or criticize them. And uh, I, I feel for them. We need to all pray for our national leaders and our local leaders. But the fact of the matter is, someone needs to step up with power and with a, a reasonable, logical sense of authority and say, listen, let's go back to where we began and pick it up. And that's a great message for the Christian. Let's get back to where we started and pick it up with the power of God and the gospel of salvation. You say, how does that... Co correlate, Jack, with this uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Oh, it does. You just wait and see. It sure does. But we can't go any further in our journey regarding the Holy Spirit until we deal with this very important issue of what is the unpardonable sin. Ephesians chapter 4. This is introduction, but once we get in, we'll go pretty quick. Introduction, Ephesians 4, verse 30. Listen to this. Especially, listen, if you're a Jehovah Witness right now, you need to listen to this. Because you're taught that the Holy Spirit is not a person. By the way, if you're a Jew tonight and you're watching, you're taught also that the Holy Spirit is not a person. And if you're a Muslim, you're taught that the Holy Spirit is not a person. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. This is very specific. It's not the Spirit of God. It's capital S, the Holy Spirit of God. This is, listen, this is the Godhead but a very specific member of the God. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This verse is directing right straight to the person of the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve. You cannot grieve a street light. You, not, you cannot grieve a stop sign. You cannot grieve all of these seats that are here in this great sanctuary. You can't grieve this microphone. You can only grieve a person. And the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption because he can be offended. That word grieve, by the way, uh, lupio in Greek, it means to cause distress upon, to bring grief, to cause sorrow, to make sorrowful the heart of another. To make sorrowful the heart of another. And God says, don't do that regarding the Holy Spirit. So before we can get to the future studies of the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the coming upon of the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and why the Holy Spirit is so necessary in our lives, we need to experience the fact that we need to deal with this is issue of sinning against the Holy Spirit. Why is it the unpardonable sin? And you might be asking the question, Pastor Jack, have I committed that sin? 
Maybe you're sitting somewhere in the world and you're wondering, my goodness, did I commit that sin? Did I bless me? Did, at some stage of my life, did I speak against the Holy Spirit? Just hang on. Just hang on. Yeah, it'll be clear. So number one, if you write it down together, this is our sixth installment of this study, but listen, number one, regarding what is the unpardonable sin, will you write this down? It's a long title, it's a long heading, but it's important. It is a sin that is, mark this, beyond Christ's forgiveness. And I'm gonna pause for effect. It's beyond Christ, that's Christ Jesus's act of forgiveness. You say, Jack, what are you talking about? Are you saying that Jesus didn't die for all the sins of the world? Nope, Jesus died for all the sins of the world. Write that down. Scripture makes that very clear. When Christ died on the cross, he died for all of mankind's sins from Adam to the end. But listen carefully. What we're talking about right now is this. This, this sin that we're talking about of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is beyond Christ's forgiveness, and we're going to see various reasons. Why is that the case? Christ will not forgive this type of sin or this particular sin. He's, he's never issued forgiveness for it. He will not change that position that he's taken on it. It's an eternal position of God. It is the very nature of God, and that's not going to go away. No matter what you might think or say, it's not going to go away. It's beyond Christ's forgiveness. It's not beyond Christ's ability. It's beyond Christ's will to forgive. He will not do it. There is a line that a man or a woman can cross that is too far. So Jesus Christ himself introduces us to the fact that there's this sin that is beyond his will to forgive. And that comes as a shock to us, but we'll see it in Scripture together as we walk through this. By the way, turn to Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And while you're turning there, uh, just keep this in mind that according to Jesus, the unpardonable or the unforg unforgivable sin is absolutely unique. Okay, it's absolutely unique uh, in that it is a sin of such a nature uh, that it will not be forgiven of because of what it affects or what it does. Uh, you can rob a bank, that's a sin. You can commit sexual immorality and that's a sin. You can lie, that's a sin. You can fill in the blank, that's a sin. For all of those sins, Christ died. But this sin is something that cuts someone off from the hope of salvation, from the realm of salvation, from the power of God himself to save. And that's a strong statement, and I understand that, but please bear with me through this study. Isaiah 59, verse one and two. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Isaiah is speaking to the nation of Judah, no doubt about it, but to Israel and beyond in the word of God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear or hear you specifically. There is sin in the life of the believer that when we do sin as believers, God, God stops listening to us. He waits for us to confess our sin. Write it down, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, that's written to the believer, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise given to us by God to every believer. And that forgiveness is to maintain fellowship among God to believer, believer to God, and believer to believer. Communion, fellowship, koinonia with God and family of God. That's, this is not what we're talking about here regarding the unpardonable sin. John chapter 19, verse 14. John 19, 14 says, Now Pilate said to the Jews, Behold your king. This is at the crucifixion. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Listen to what they said. The chief priest answered, and said this to Pilate. You're going to want to write this down in a moment. We have no king but Caesar. This is absolutely monumental. The religious leadership, the custodians of the Bible of the Old Testament, 
when prophecy was standing in front of them, even Pilate, a, a, a Roman Gentile, says, behold, your king. They get furious and they about lose their mind. Another gospel tells us that they went mad or angry with madness. And they said, crucify him. The word, by the way, implies in the original Greek language of the New Testament that uh, they are, gr uh, gr um, what's the word, grit or grinding the teeth, gnashing the teeth with anger. They're so upset. Away with him, away with him. They're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And it's, it's almost as though God is trying to speak through Pilate to them and slap them with some reality. Wait, you want me to crucify your king? And they said, absolutely. Because you know what? Our king is Caesar. And I, I don't know, but just thinking that in my head, the, the word coming out of their mouth, these were the representatives of God to the people and the people to God for Israel. And they said, Caesar's our king. They're out of their minds. They've lost it. And you say, why is that so important? Because listen, 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 please get this. This is not denial. These guys are not denying Jesus Christ like Peter did in a, in a moment or a season of weakness. This is not denial. This is absolute flagrant rejection of the doctrine and of the person of Christ and the works of God. You say, I thought we were talking about the Holy Spirit. Just hang on. Just hang on. It's not denial. You need to mark this down. Because some of you feel like you've committed the unpardonable sin because at some point in time, you knew Christ was asking you to stand up and say something or get up and do something and you didn't do it. And you feel like you've committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, you didn't. In a moment of weakness, you denied Christ. That's forgivable. Just ask Peter. No, I'm talking about rejection. Mark chapter 3, verse 22. Mark 3, 22 is Mark's account of this unpardonable act of sin. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem. So mark this. These are educated. Jesus never said, thus saith the Lord. I love that. Not once did Jesus ever say, thus saith the Lord. Remember the Old Testament prophets would say, thus saith the Lord. And they would give forth their prophecy. Jesus never did that. Not once. You, you want to know why? Because he was the Lord. That's why he said, and I say to you. I love that. And I say to you. And Jesus says to them, all sins will be forgiven of the sons of men. And whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation or damnation. Verse 30, because they said, he's going to give us the answer now. Here's the answer. You say, Jack, what was the answer? What happened? What caused Jesus to say that? Here it is. Are you ready? Here it is. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. You say, that's the answer? Well, what about all the time that I said terrible things about the Holy Spirit when I was a non-believer? Here's the difference. You said what you said, but it was not yet, as we'll see in a moment, a doctrine of your belief system. You were absolutely ignorant about the power and the mercy and the grace and the word and the will of God. You were an unbeliever, you didn't know, and you sinned in ignorance. You knew you shouldn't talk like that. You were cursing and cussing, but you didn't understand. These guys are the custodians of the Bible itself, and they knew all the prophetic words of God. They knew from other portions of Scripture. They knew the scandal about his life for 33 years. They knew that this was the one that prophets had been speaking about. This was the one who was born in Bethlehem. We remember being told by our dads and by our grandpas the, that there were rumors about angels appearing at his birth. And all of the stuff that, they knew that. And they could have gone right to Isaiah, right to Micah, right to Psalms, and they would have been able to look right into the Bible. They knew the Bible, and they, they, they weren't, listen, they weren't in denial of the Bible. They rejected the Bible. They rejected the witness of God. 
So when we talk about this sin being beyond Christ's forgiveness, we're talking about the reason why is what they had in their hearts. What was their mode of belief? What is it that they believed? And I want to ask you today, what is it that you believe? That is the greatest question you can ever be asked. Every other question wanes in comparison compared to what I'm about to ask you. Who is Jesus Christ? Whose son is he? Was the question Jesus said of himself. Think of it. That's the greatest question you'll ever be asked. Who's Jesus Christ? And you better have the answer. If you don't know the answer, you need to stay tuned to this message right now. God will only accept one answer. These believed in their heart a particular way of thinking. And that thinking was, he has an unclean spirit. They weren't saying that to be mean. They weren't saying that to be accurate in their minds. Nope. They believed Jesus was operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's beyond Christ's forgiveness. It's what they believed about Christ. That this particular sin is directed at Christ. Yes, listen. But the vehicle or mode or minister of salvation in this world to you and I right now is none other than the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come and exalt all that Christ has done and the words that he has spoken. They were in the position of being beyond Christ's forgiveness because they were committing and staying committed to, to death, this sin that is unpardonable. That's extremely important. Secondly, mark this down. What is the unpardonable sin? It is the sin that is the ultimate act of pride. The ultimate act of pride. You know, listen, um, Christianity, uh, as, as far as I know, Christianity is the only faith group in the world that I'm aware uh, that this is true of. In Christianity, our arch enemy to ourselves and to our brothers and sisters and vice versa one another is an attitude or a heart of pride. It is, according to Christianity, according to the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, it is the worst sin of all. Pride. Pride is behind all of their sin. Are you, are you manipulating somebody right now? with sweet talk? It's because of pride in your heart. Are you using somebody at the job to get this at a better rate for the other thing and rather than being a good businessman or woman, you're manipulating them for your own gain? Why? Pride. Why are you trying to uh, get, get into that, that, uh, that thing and you, you, can't, you, won't, you just can't live without, you're gonna steal, cheat, and whatever it takes, you gotta get into that system. Or you got to get into to USC or, or, uh, or Harvard. You got to get in there. What is it? Pride. Pride. Pride's the number one thing in Christianity that is the outright uh, sin. And you say, well, I thought you just said the unforgivable sin's the, the, the biggest. It is the biggest, but the foundation of it is, the, is pride. They would not believe. Why? Because of Pride. And pride traffics in and out of the human heart. Don't even think for a moment that you're humble. If you think for a moment, if you are impressed with how humble you are, you are probably in the top 10 most prideful people on earth. I'm just so, I'm so humble. You just, I, I'm so humble. Oh, it's, you, you don't worry. Uh, I'm just humble. That's sick. You think like that? That's ultimate pride, man. That's crazy. When, when, listen, when, when, when you are running low on pride, which is a good thing, you, you probably might in a very healthy way think like this. Hey, I know there's enough pride in me that makes God sick because what I see in me makes me sick. And so God, I just pray that you would just take hold of my hands and my feet and my mind and my tongue and my eyes and just walk me day by day, God, because I don't trust me in this world without you. I need you, God. I can't live without you. Recognize the pride that's in you and rather than hug it, resist it. These guys wouldn't do that. 
And the person that has, has committed or is committing the unpardonable sin, they could never think like that. They're the authority. They've got it right. They're reject, they may not believe anything for sure, but they reject Christ. The ultimate display of pride. It's pride. Serious pride. Here's a fearful example. I'm going to read, this is a huge chunk. Grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew 23. It's a huge portion. Turn there, follow along. I'm reading out of the New King James Version Bible. New King James Version. By the way, while you're turning there, Matthew 23, a lot of people are writing me and asking me, what, what is my favorite study Bible? And um, it's the, it's the uh, Moody Publishers. I think it's Moody. It's out of print now, but you can still find them. Ryrie, R-Y-R-I-E, Ryrie, Charles C. Ryrie, Study Bible, New King James Version, specifically is what I love. They've been out of print for decades. Um, I have, I have a, I've collected them because when they went out of print, I started buying them. Um, I, saw, I saw one for sale two nights ago. I told my wife, look at this. <laughs> but I saw one for sale for $2,000 on eBay, 2,000 bucks. And then, uh, listen, you can buy them. People don't know what they got. And uh, people buy them. You can buy them for 59 bucks, 60 bucks. Okay, I stalled long enough. Matthew 23, verse 13. Everybody look down. Follow along with me. You're going to hear pride being addressed by Jesus Christ. To the scribes and Pharisees, mind you. The religious hierarchy. You ready? Matthew 23, 13. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one convert, and when you have won him, you make him twice as much as a son of hell as you are yourselves. Woe to you, scribes or blind guides, who say, whoever uh, swears by the temple, it's nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, it is, he's obliged to perform it. Fools, blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? It's the temple, is what Jesus is saying, not the gold. And, verse 18, whoever swears by the altar is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it? Fools? Blind? For which is greater, the gift or the that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Verse 22, and he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Can you believe, church, this is Jesus speaking? Oh, Jesus, meek and mild. Not when it comes to confronting pride. He's speaking directly to pride right now. For you pay tithe in mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matter of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Well, it's fleshly pursuits. Blind Pharisees, First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men. This is why God hates religious. Pride's bad enough, but self-righteousness just causes God to vomit. Think of that. But inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, 
we would not have been partakers of them in the blood of the prophets. Verse 31, therefore you are witnesses against yourself that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Verse 32, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, yikes. He's really turning it up. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I send you prophets. Listen, I don't want to get derailed. I'll just say, say this quickly. That is a declaration out of the mouth of Jesus regarding his deity. Boom. Slam dunk, over and out. Jesus says it. I sent to you, Israel, your prophets. That's thousands of years of prophets. Wise men I've sent, scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, who you murder between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says, all these things will come upon this generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Here it is. Wait for it. But you were not willing. That's it. You're not willing. You hear it. You saw it. You've heard my preaching, Jesus is saying, you watch the miracles and you, re you absolutely reject the reality of who I am. You say, Pastor, you know, you're getting all excited. I've never, I've never killed anybody. That doesn't apply to me. I've never acted like that. Let me ask you something. Who's Jesus Christ? Who is he? Who's Jesus? Your answer, if your answer is not the right answer, your answer is just as bad as these scribes and Pharisees. And if you die without having the right answer, then you are exactly guilty of committing the unpardonable sin. If you remain in that way, you will die in your sins and you'll be outside the bounds of Christ's redemption and Christ's salvation. Listen up, everyone. A lot of you have been lied to that there's some form of salvation after death. That's nowhere in the Bible. That's made up by people. You cannot find that in the Bible. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's very important you understand that. There's a difference between ignorance and willful ignorance. If you're ignorant because you don't know, that can be fixed. But if you know the way and you, you're not denying it, you're rejecting it. That's different. That's, that's called willful ignorance. You know that the one is in front of you to save you, but you won't even look at him. You won't even call out to him. If you die like that, you're committing the blasphemy sin of the Holy Spirit. This will develop more. Thirdly, jot this down. It is the sin that is, listen, faith in reverse. Faith in reverse. Instead of faith going forward, as God engineered it to be experienced normally. Watch everyone. I have to exaggerate this somehow. I don't want to sound corny when I say this because it, so, it sounds so empty, but it's true. Every human being has this, what is said, a Christ-shaped hole in their heart. And that's a really fun thing to say to kids. They get it. Adults kind of like, oh, that's, that's really lame. But let me put it to you this way. Every human being knows inside they're lost to some degree or another. They know they're not found. They know they're lost. And they know that their life is empty. Inside of every person that is thinking, there's this thought of there's got to be more to life and there's got to be life after death. I'm, it's, it's plaguing me. That thought is driving me. That is from God. And faith normally moves forward to find the answer. This sin is faith in reverse. It sees the answer. It sees the, the, the foundation of who faith should be placed in, and it, and it pulls away from him. It recoils back from him. 
There's people on their deathbeds and you, and you invite them to know Jesus and they, and they go, get out of the hospital, get out of here. They get angry. It's bizarre. In, in 30 years of ministry, I can, I can tell you that three times, three times in those 30 years, I see the people who I was asked by the family to go and share the gospel at, at their deathbed. And they were laying there and laying there and I said, hi, I'm Pastor Jack and your family asked me to give you the gospel. Get out! Get out! They didn't even know me. And they died in unbelief. Remarkable. Faith in reverse is this. It's a way of belief that's a godless faith. See, how can, how can you put... God, what do you mean godless faith? It's either faith or not faith. No, 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 no. Everyone's, everyone has faith. Where's your faith directed? There can be a godless faith, you know. The scribes and the Pharisees, they had witnessed his irrefutable evidence that Jesus Christ was in fact the miracle worker Messiah. That the scripture said he was and that who he himself claimed he was. But remember, they attributed the work of the Holy Spirit in him. Because remember, Jesus did the power, the miracles, the Bible says, by the work, by the power of the Holy Spirit. They saw Isaiah 35 being fulfilled in front of them, and they not only rejected Jesus, but they, they commenced a life campaign to try to kill him. John chapter 8, verse 23. Am I going too fast? I'm trying to uh, stay within a time frame, even though I'm in your living room right now. <laughs> I need to stay true to time. John 8, 23. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. He's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, ego emi, that's the name of God, the eternal one, you will die in your sins. You say, oh, pastor, I just don't believe that. You're rejecting Christ. I, you know, I just don't believe it the way that you do. Excuse me, I don't want you to believe it the way that I believe it. I want you to believe it the way God put it. Don't, don't, don't think for a moment this is my message. <laughs> this is not my message. This is his message. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm asking you to agree with God. Well, pastor, I just, you know, I'm gonna, I, as long as I'm sincere, you are rejecting Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans 1, 18 to 24. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why? How come? Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Present tense. It's not... well. It's been revealed to them and it is constantly being revealed to them like the heavens above. We know they're there and every night we go out there and we see the heavens above and they are still speaking to us about the nature and the existence of God. For God has shown it to them. Verse 20, Romans 1 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that he has made, even his eternal power and Godhead. That's the Trinity so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, that is, they knew about God's existence, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise. By the way, that's the next step of pride. You turn into an idiot because you become so self-educated and impressed about yourself that you begin to lose your mind with how you speak. You think you're speaking incredible, deep things of man, and you think you, you know, you're just so impressed with yourself. Isn't it amazing that the Bible tells us that over time, when people learn, 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 learn without God, they profess themselves to be wise, but look what God says, they become fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. That's, that's, by the way, the faith of evolution. And birds and four-footed animals and creepy things. Verse 24, therefore God also has given them up. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They die in that belief, 
means that God has given them up. Why? Because they have turned their back on God in full rejection. Next, I think it's fourth on our argument here. What is the unpardonable sin? It is a sin that what you believe about God. It's what you believe about God. It's the very doctrine that you live by, friend. What governs your decision-making process in all of life? None of us are sinless. We'll never be sinless. None of us can point the finger at another. We understand that. But what is the doctrine of your life? Is it Oprah? Is it New Age? Is it First Baptist? Is it Second Baptist? Third Baptist? Is it Calvary Chapel? Is it Lutheran? Is it Assembly of God? Is it Muslim? Is it uh, Judaism? What is, is it Hinduism? Is it Buddhism? What is it? You have a belief system. No, no, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I got my own thing. You are it. That is your belief system. So the question is, what doctrine do you live by? That's your true faith. What governs your life? John 3, 15 says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Listen up, here it comes. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For men, uh, verse 24, everyone who practices evil hates the lights and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light. And your response is? Your response is, is what to Jesus? Well, pastor, I just don't believe that. You're rejecting Christ. It's just as unforgivable as the Pharisees sinned against the Holy Spirit looking at Jesus' face back then if you die in this belief system of yours, there's no hope for you. There's no hope for you. If you die in this condition, and you will enter eternity having committed the unpardonable sin. Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed unto every man once to die, and then comes the judgment. No second chance. There's no purgatory that's invented. There's no uh, holding tank. There's no reboot. There's no upgrade. It's heaven or hell after death. The Bible's very clear. But you know, Jack, that was then. You know, what about today? Can someone commit that sin today? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, maybe you're asking the question, are you com have you committed it or are you committing that sin? Let me be very careful how I answer you. A decent Bible scholar will say something like this. Write this down, get ready. A decent Bible scholar, student of the word, will say, no, you cannot commit that sin now because technically the scribes and Pharisees were looking at Jesus face to face in the flesh, in their time zone, in reality, in front of him. They literally saw the power of the Holy Spirit at work. They literally saw the Spirit of God raise the dead through Christ. They literally heard him preach and see lives transformed. So that sin could only have been committed by them then at that time. And I say a decent scholar because that is true. Almost. Pretty much so. But not all the way. It was certainly true of those eyewitnesses. It's, listen, it's not true about you right now if you're still living. You have not committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Something has to happen now, 21 centuries later, for that sin to be repeated now. Because Christ isn't physically here. 
he is not physically able to be argued with or agreed with. But the Holy Spirit is. And it's the Holy Spirit's testimony in your life. It is the Holy Spirit's witness in your life. The Spirit of God is telling you to consider Jesus. It's the Spirit of God that bothers you. And he's pointing you to Jesus. And if you die tonight like that, you are lost forever, for all eternity. You will have died in your unbelief. And there's no hope for you. That would have been your decision. Christ, all your life, has been reaching out to you in your mind and in your heart. I want to read to you one of the old scholars from yesteryear wrote, they committed the unpardonable sin by accusing Jesus Christ in person right before them in their very eyes while he was on earth of being demon-possessed. They were not speaking out of ignorance or misunderstanding. It was not some vague critic of who Jesus was. The Pharisees knew exactly that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God to save Israel. They knew the prophecies were being fulfilled. They saw Jesus' wonderful works. They heard his clear presentation of truth, yet they deliberately chose to reject the truth, and by doing so, they slandered the Holy Spirit. They defiantly closed their eyes and became willfully blind. Thus, Dr. Jesus examined their hearts because he can. And then he, Jesus, pronounced that sin to be unforgivable. Jesus will tell them that unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's the, that's the key. Today, you may not believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. You may not believe that. You may not believe that Jesus said, you cannot come to the Father but through me. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to see me at the cross. You've got to go to the tomb. You've got to see me in the tomb. You've got to go to the tomb and see the tomb empty. You've got to believe all that the prophets spoke of me, Jesus would tell you. And believe on me. Trust me. And if you make that decision to follow Christ, you will be coming from that specter that, think of it, it's as though there's an ax one inch from your neck in the invisible realm. Can you imagine? We're skipping around on this picture-perfect evening in Southern California. It's so, it's so beautiful and empty. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's around. It's so weird. But it's beautiful, and if you're not careful, you can focus on all the beauty of it and wind up miss, missing the creator of it all. And there's an invisible, imagine there's a reaper, an angelic reaper with an ax right behind your head. 24-7, 365, and there's a, there's a moment in time when God fulfills his word to you that he's made to all of us he says, my spirit will not always strive with man. He placed a limitation on your life. When your number's up, my friend, God's appointed a certain amount of days known only to God. When your number's up, your number's up. You will have lost and exhausted the time of repentance and salvation. The opportunity will evaporate from you like the summer sun pulling up moisture from a petal or a leaf of a plant. It's, it's there and then it's gone. What would happen right now if you were to die? What would become of you? So as we wrap this up, I'm just gonna ask you right now to make that decision for Jesus Christ. And as you're thinking about that right now, and maybe God's speaking to you, I want to ask you a couple questions. Can God turn a person around? Well, you know, pastor. No, 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 no. Can God turn a person around? Second question is, what kind of a person can God turn around? I'm asking you right now. What kind of a person does God, can God turn around? What do you know about that? Do you think you have to be good to get into heaven? 
God never said that anywhere. Third question is, would God even turn a man or a woman like you around? If right now you are saying, Pastor Jack, I wish God would forgive me, guess what? He's already working in your life because you couldn't have thought that thought without thinking of how lost you are. And you don't want to die like that. Say yes to Jesus now. Yes to the cross. Yes to the empty tomb. Yes that he's Lord. Maybe, maybe you're saying, uh, I don't know. I'll wait on this. That's your decision. But can he turn somebody like you around? If you have a deep sense of condemnation, the good news is, yes, he does. Yes, he can. Are you willing? You may be hearing this challenge right now and you're saying, I don't need any of this stuff. Pride is killing you. I want to show you a video as we end. It's going to kind of take your breath away. I'm going to ask you to get ready. We'll close. We'll end with it. But um, I deliberately ask you those three questions because... You know, the Bible t- tells us, commands us that we should pray for our rulers and our leaders. You know that? Uh, those of you in England, do you pray for Boris Johnson and members of the parliament? Do you know their names? And what is your minister? What's your, what's your, uh, what's your MP's name? Where you're from? Or wherever you're from in the world. Do you pray for your leaders? You're supposed to if you're a Christian. I'm going to ask you to watch what we put up on the screen, and we'll end with this. There was a great revival in the Hebrides in the early 1900s. Began to move, moved up to the pleading for it into the 40s. Maybe we could say it topped out in the early 50s. Two old women, one was 84 years old and one was 82 years old. One was blind and one was humped over so badly with spinal stenosis, just, just arched over. But they had passion for revival. They wanted God to work. This, this is what happened. They couldn't even get out to the church to pray. They couldn't even get out to the church to worship. Their house became a place to meet. People came in. They got so passionate about revival coming to the, their isle, the Isle of Lewis. They got so passionate about it. They confronted the preacher and wanted to know if he was thoroughly right with God. <laughs> and they prayed and prayed and prayed. And they'd seen the Lord, they said, with the church filled up and God blessing and a great overflow. And the fire of God struck that tiny little obscure place off the coast of Scotland. And when it happened, there was a young teenage boy that got saved in it. His name was Donald. And the preacher became so dependent upon Donald and so close to Donald, he would ask him to lead in public prayers and help him with the meetings, and he did. Oh, how God worked. People began to hear about it, and the revival fire spread. It spread. God blessed in a, in a great way. Those two old women, the people, kind of people, people don't want in a church anymore. And from that same island, there was a, a young girl who was a cousin to Donald Smith, who immigrated to America. Her name was Marianne Smith McLeod. She came to America in 1936. She met a man named Fred. And they were married. They fell in love. They were married. God blessed in a great way. And those old women were her aunts. And they came out of that fiery revival, that fiery revival. They really experienced revival. And they sent a Bible copy of the Word of God that had been used in a special way in that revival to Mary Ann. She started having children. I think it was 1937, she had her first child. They named him after his father, Fred. Then she had her second child named after herself, Mary Ann. 
Then she had her third child, Elizabeth. Then she had her fourth child. And she was so impacted by this teenage boy God had used in that revival of the Hebrides. She named him Donald. And she gave him that Bible, that Hebrides Revival Bible. He was born in 1946. He's now the 45th president of the United States. And that revival Bible is in the Oval Office. I'm saying to you, I don't know how, why, I don't know how it all comes together. But I, but I believe God is putting some things together to give us just a window, just a window. If he, if he could find some open people who know what the wind is for. Can this be the time the wind is open? Providentially, God has prepared the moment and we will become the people of prayer, pleading with God. This is a plea. Will thou not revive us again? Will you, will you, will you be a part of that? Will you? Can you stand wherever you are, please? The world has enjoyed pointing its finger at the sins of Donald Trump, thinking that for some moment, you know, that he's any different than any one of us. We're all sinners, we've all failed. It's easy to point at other people because that's what a Pharisee does. That's what pride does. That's what someone who has the religion of self does. Quick to point out faults and sin and weakness in others, but cannot see it in their own life. Maybe tonight the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. And the issue is not who's in the parliament and not who's in the palace and not who's in the White House. The issue is what's in your heart? Jesus knew their hearts and spoke unto them and said, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And tonight maybe God wants to change that in your life May the power of God come upon you wherever you may be in conviction. May you be aware of all your sin. May, there, may your hands be heavy with guilt and shame. And tonight, just when you feel like your heart's going to explode and your hands could no longer bear the load, that when you call out to the name of Jesus, you'll be set free. Will you do that right now with me? Lord, we begin, first of all, I just ask of you, Lord, that those that you're speaking to, that they would respond to you and that they would cry out to you now in their own words. Jesus, forgive me. God, help me. Christ, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I don't care how you say it. Friend, say it to him. Don't say it to me. Say it to him. And in a nanosecond of time, in a flash, in the twinkle of an eye, Faith explodes in your heart and in your tears, sorrow and sadness and grief of what and who you are and what you've become, you turn to him and immediately now, believing that Christ is resurrected from the dead, the risen savior, you're set free because that's why you're alive. That's why you're hearing this message right now and that's why Christ came so that you would never have to be a partaker of the unpardonable sin. Welcome to the family of God. There'll be those that will be giving you information about how to contact us so we can send you a Bible. Second and final thing. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth, the King of glory, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the way, the truth, and the life, the Son of David, Son of man, Son of God, we ask you that you would send revival to the United States of America and at this global moment to the entire world, God, may we see a miracle 
of revival among your church and, and salvation among the lost. And God, may we throw away our differences as Christians and come together in prayer, united around the world, linked around the world in the spirit that we would pray and God, that we would hear from you. Lord, I know as a pastor over this church, I need to hear from you about what's next our, as our world is burned, turned upside down to us, but you know exactly what's going on. What do we do next, almighty God? I'm not looking to the White House for that directive. I'm not looking to the State House for that directive. I'm not looking to the county. I'm not looking to the mayor. I'm looking to your house, almighty God, your throne room. Show us what to do. Lead us and guide us, Father. But until you show us what to do, we will keep doing what, we're, what you've called us to do. Until you stop us, Lord, we're going to keep going forward. And Heavenly Father, we pray tonight that you would use this message to your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.